welcome to Litquake, San Francisco's literary festival. I'm Jack Bulware from Litquake, and our festival runs from October 7th through the 23rd. Um, the events are live, they are recorded, they are indoor, and they are outdoors. And you can find out all the details at litquake.org. Today, we are honored to be able to present a virtual live event with Mariana Oliver. She is author of the new essay collection, Migratory Birds, which was just published by Transit Books based here in the Bay Area. Mariana is going to be in conversation with Ingrid Rojas Contreras. Many thanks to Mariana and Ingrid for joining us today. This event is sponsored by Center for the Art of Translation. So in this prize-winning debut collection, Mexican essayist Mariana Oliver explores the concept of migration in all of its many forms. It's an amazing mix of criticism, reporting, and travel writing, all infused with an abiding curiosity and a poetic ease. She leads this uh, through a, a wide variety of spaces throughout the book, from Turkey to Berlin to Mexico. And she asks us what it means to leave the familiar behind and make the unfamiliar our own. Uh, Mariana Oliver was born in Mexico City and received a master's degree in comparative literature from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She is currently working towards a doctorate degree in modern literature at the Ibero-American University in Mexico City. I probably mispronounced that. Iberian. Ibero. Ibero-American. Okay, anyway, she, and she's received a fellowship from the Foundation for from for Mexican literature. This collection, which was just published, Migratory Birds, was awarded the Jose Vasconcelos National Young Essay Award. And our um, interlocutor for today, Ingrid Rojas Contreras, was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. Her essays and short stories have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, BuzzFeed, Nylon, and Guernica, among many others. She has received numerous awards and fellowships, and her first novel, Fruit of the Drunken Tree was a New York Times editor's choice. She is currently working on a family memoir set in Columbia. A few quick orders of business before we begin. Don't forget to follow Litquake on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates. You can also support both of the authors today by buying their books. That's why they write them. You can go to your independent bookstore wherever you live, or you can also go to Litquake's bookshelf um, located at bookshop.org. And we also ask for your support of the Litquake organization to allow us to continue to bring you these free events. Um, if you believe in keeping literature a key component of the cultural landscape of San Francisco, please consider dropping us a few bucks. Everything helps. Um, you can reach us through Venmo or PayPal, or you can go directly to litquake.org. So let's get on with the show. Um, we will take your questions after about 45 minutes in. So just use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please welcome Mariana and Ingrid. Thank you, Jack. Um, hi, Mariana, how are you? <laughs> hi, Ingrid. Hi, everything's fine, thank you. Um, and you're, I just wanted people to know you're calling from Mexico City, so that's, Wonderful that you could join us. Thank you so much for, um, and for writing this beautiful book. Um, we wanted to start off by, by having Mariana read about, uh, from it in Spanish, and then I'm gonna read from it in English. And we just wanted you to, to hear a little bit of the text before we launched into our conversation. Um, and for everyone attending, if you feel free to use the chat, I, I love when the audience participates. So if you have any comments or emojis along the way, feel free to do that. Um, so Mariana, do you wanna do you wanna start? Yes, of course. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much to all of you for being here. I would like to thank the organizers, uh, of course, Transit Books, my publishers, and of course, thank you so much, Ingrid, for having this conversation with me today. So I'm going to start reading uh, the first part of the first essay called uh, Aves Migratorias. I'm going to read in Spanish as Ingrid said, and then read it. I'm going to read it in English. So, uh, okay. Aves Migratorias. Todas las escuelas de vuelo en Canadá rechazaron al joven Bill Lishman. El entusiasmo es insuficiente cuando un campo de hierba y la pista de aterrizaje te parecen del mismo color. Si un gen recesivo ha viajado por generaciones, 
hasta instala, instalarse en tu cromosoma X y te ha vuelto incapaz de distinguir entre el verde y el rojo, no puedes ser bombero, ni pintor, ni electricista. Si no ves la diferencia entre la cáscara de una manzana fresca y otra demasiado madura, tampoco puedes volar aviones. Tendrás que mirarlos desde la ventana, como a los pájaros. Y justo así, a través de la ventana, mirando pájaros, el joven Bill observó su piel implume y supo que sentía envidia de las alas. Así que decidió construirse unas para enmendar su cuerpo imperfecto. Antes que él, los seres humanos habían aprendido a volar observando el movimiento de las aves. Su vuelo y el de los aviones se rigen por los mismos principios. Las alas son planos aerodinámicos que dependen de la fuerza del aire. Encima de ellas, la presión debe ser menor, mientras que debajo, mayor. Esa es la clave para sobreponerse a la gravedad. Una de las ventajas de crecer en el campo es que el patio trasero de cualquier casa se puede convertir en pista de práctica de vuelo. Diariamente, Bill subía una colina arrastrando la otra mitad de su cuerpo, una extensa superficie de tela con forma de delta que sujetaba su torso al llegar a la cima. Provisto de alas, corría cuesta abajo para que el golpe del viento lo levantara de la tierra. Cuando el despegue era exitoso, la sensación del suelo rozándole los pies era lo primero y lo último. Grácil, su cuerpo se elevaba sobre el techo de la casa donde había crecido, por encima de los árboles alineados y monocromáticos. Después, el inevitable descenso, cuando el peso de la carne redobla y las alas se vuelven una prótesis dolorosa, un remedio de sí mismas. Como los vuelos le parecían cada vez más cortos y estaba cansado de subir la colina una y otra vez con el ala delta a cuestas, Bill le añadió un motor. A finales de la década de los 70, Bill Lishman se convirtió en pionero del vuelo de aviones ultraligeros. Algunas veces, de manera inesperada, es posible anticipar fragmentos del futuro en un momento. Hay destellos que desgarran el curso de lo cotidiano, una epifanía de la que después no es posible desprenderse. En medio de un vuelo de práctica, Bill se dio cuenta de que no estaba solo. Lo envolvía una bandada numerosa de patos que emigraba hacia el sur. Durante unos minutos, la velocidad de las aves y la velocidad de sus ultraligeros se sincronizaron y recorrieron juntos algunos metros. Era como si su cuerpo se hubiera multiplicado. Volando entre aves, Bill se convirtió en una. Y aunque había aprendido a manejar aviones porque disfrutaba estar solo, la compañía de los pájaros blancos en el aire era un placer repentino que lo hacía sentir menos vulnerable. Eh, muchas gracias. Um, so I'm going to read, read this one in the translation. Um, I hadn't heard the original text and I, it's, so, it's so beautiful. Uh, migratory birds. Bill Lishman was turned down by every aviation school in Canada. No amount of enthusiasm will help if a run, runway and a field of grass look the same color. If a recessive gene is passed down through generations and settles in your X chromosome so that you can't tell red from green, you won't be working as a firefighter, a painter, or an electrician. If you can't tell a fresh apple skin from one that's too ripe, you won't be allowed to pilot planes. You'll have to watch them through the window like birds. Just like that, as he watched the birds through the window, a young Bill Lishman looked down at his featherless skin and realized he envied their wings. So he decided to build himself a pair to amend his imperfect body. Before him, mankind had learned to fly by observing the movement of birds. The flight of birds and of planes is governed by the same principles. Wings are flat aerodynamic surfaces that rely on the force of air. The pressure above needs to be lesser and the pressure below greater. This is the key to defying gravity. One advantage of growing up in the countryside is that any backyard can be turned into your own practice runway. Bill used to climb a hill every day, dragging behind him the other half of his body, a broad delta-shaped canvas surface that he strapped to his torso on reaching the summit. Fitted with wings, he dashed downhill and a gust of wind would lift him from the earth. On a successful takeoff, the feeling of the ground brushing his feet was first and last. His body gracefully rose above the house where he'd grown up and above the row of monochrome, monochrome trees. Then came the inevitable descent when the body's weight doubles and the wings turn into painful prosthetics, cheap knockoffs. Because his flights fell shorter and shorter and he was tired of hauling his delta wing up the hill time and again, Bill added an engine. 
By the late 70s, Bill Lishman had become a pioneer of ultralight aviation. Sometimes, out of the blue, you catch a glimpse of the future, a moment of insight that disrupts the day to day, a revelation that becomes impossible to shake off. In the middle of a practice flight, Bill noticed he was no longer alone, but encircled by a large flock of ducks migrating south. For a couple of minutes, the speed of the birds and of the aircraft were one and the same, and together they traveled a short distance. It was like his body had multiplied. As he flew among the birds, Bill became one too. And even though he taught himself to pilot planes because he enjoyed solitude, the airborne company of those dusky brown birds was an unexpected pleasure that made him feel less vulnerable. Um, Thank you so, so much, Ingrid. You're so welcome. This is, I hadn't heard the story before, um, and I did find video of this happening that I wanted to share with you all because it, you know, to you hear it and it's incredible and then you see it and you're like, what is happening? Um, So I think part of the video is the camera. He he has the camera, and I think the other part is um, somebody else. First time I took off, and they just circled back on that. So I'm trying the next day. And that's sorry, we don't need to hear what he's saying. Um, but then yeah, at some point he was like guiding. Let me see if I can move some of this around. Um, he was guiding the the birds and was actually taking the 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 central position um and learning to or, or teaching them to like land in different um places or like leading them to to different ponds that that had more food um or like had warmer weather um so just found it so fascinating um and mariana i was i was very interested to know and i love the choice of um starting with this this um this uh event this uh bill lishman and starting and opening the book with that um and i was wondering uh how you made that decision i know you know the book is is um fragmentary essays that have to do with like movement and flight and freedom um and memory and language um and i i wondered for you how starting with this one was the perfect opening into all that you wanted to talk about in the book. Okay. Well, uh, I think that this is um, not the last, but the previous one I wrote. Uh, I, well, this essay, as many others in this book, started with a trip, with a travel. I was in DC with my family on vacation, and we were walking into, in, through the zoo. And I remember very clearly, that I saw an empty cage and I read a note, note, a note, and, and I remember that I heard about this story in a movie that I saw many times when I was a child. Mm -hmm. So I get obsessed with that uh, empty cage and started to think about this apparently strange um, uh, act about these uh, birds flying without with a man without knowing or knowing or about um, this way to get back home. or So many questions started um, in that moment. For example, what's home? How could a place that you have never seen be in home? Uh, well, when I finished writing the second part of your question, when I, I finished um, the essays of this book, I noticed that they were like a trip. So uh, I decided to start with this story about flying birds and finish with home. And I ch changed the name of many of these essays to read like a, like a journey, like a travel book. So that's the reason why many of these essays uh, have the name of a city. So uh, that was a, a, a choice I, I went at the end of the process. Yeah, to, to start with this essay, with this particular essay, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, 
what I love about that too is that it um the I think that we tend to think of um travel in one way um and the 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 way that you treat travel and you treat like our call to movement our desire to kind of as Jack was saying when he was introducing the book um which I think is put very nicely the the leaving behind the familiar and then claiming the unfamiliar as what what is home um and so then in that sense like this this opening essay makes makes a lot of sense um can you tell me about the process of of writing the book or the origin of of how the how the book was was born yes of course uh, i wrote uh, migratory birds between 2010 and 2015. Uh, uh, thanks to a creative writing fellowship I got in an institution called uh, Fundación para las Letras Mexicanas. Uh, it's gonna sound a little bit strange, but at that time I had no experience in creative writing. Just, uh, just, with my, just doing academic research, that was my, my life at that time. So I noticed that I was in a big trouble because I had no idea how to, how to do that. So I thought, well, I can't, I have to fix this and how will I do that? And my answer was, well, reading, just reading. So I just started to read a lot of uh, essays at a time to find out how they were constructed and to find also my own rhythm to write. Uh, at that time, also, I had just came back from Germany from a, a, um, a short uh, research I done there because of my master's. So many questions about identity, language, and home uh, were really close to me at that time. So these questions about language, and of course, identity also, I think that guide uh, all the other essays. That's like the line I, I, I was thinking in because of that experience uh, of being a foreigner was close to me at the time. And to live in a dual language so different from Spanish also. Mm -hmm. Did you did you know German before traveling? To uh, well, uh, yes, I went to the first time I think when I was like twenty years old, because I did my bachelor's degree is in German literature, so I started to learn German when I was eighteen like, years old, and I went to a to a summer course in in Germany in, at that time. I stayed there just one month and it was like strange to me. And then I came back from my, my, my master's to do this research. So it was like uh, being and being living there, but not uh, knowing that I was not going to stay there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to be in German next year for, for months and it's a little bit strange it's like to come back and have uh, everything, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, and you write about German throughout the text um, and in, in such a, beautiful way too like there's there's a lot of um yeah there's a lot of looking at what what the language means um the, what the root would mean in one word and in one language and then another um but what i really love about the way that you write about language is that you're also writing about language as if it were a place um so the one of the i think very exciting things that you write about in the book is that when you speak in a language that isn't yours, that is also a kind of movement, that is also like a kind of travel that you're making and it implies a place where you came from and then it also implies um, where you're going or where you're headed or even like where you live that's not like your, your home. Um, and you were also writing about um, her name is, she's a Turkish writer, Ermin Ozdemar. Um, and I just, I wanted to read out what she, what she, um, and in answer to like why she writes. So she's, she's uh, of Turkish origin and then she, she's in Germany and she writes in German. Um, and she gets asked about like why she, why not write, uh, why choose like German as the, as the language that she's writing in. Um, and she had a very beautiful answer, which also um, struck you. So this is um, what she was saying. I am unhappy in my language. For years, we've only spoken sentences like, they'll hang them. Where are their heads? 
No one knows where their graves are. The police have not released the bodies. Our wards are sick. My wards are in need of a sanatorium, like sick muscles. There is a place in the agency where three sea currents come together. People take sacks of mussels there from Istanbul, Izmir, and Italy, where they've gotten sick in the filthy water. The clean water from these three currents heals the sick mussels in a matter of months. Fishermen call this part of the sea the mussel sanatorium. How long does it take a word to heal? They say people lose their mother tongues in foreign countries, but can't this happen to in a person's home country? Um, and it's such a, it's, I, I think I've just been like thinking about that over and over again since I've um, read it. Um, and I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about your relationship to Spanish and other languages that you, that you speak, what each of them feels like to you, like what, if they're a place, like what, what are they each like? Okay. Uh, well, uh, language, Spanish is my mother tongue, of course, but I'm sure that I learned Spanish when I started to learn German because I, everything that was familiar for me in Spanish was strange in, in German. And for example, uh, I think that when you do learn another language, it's like you you all necessarily you have to to see the world in another way, yeah. Not just because of the name of the things, uh, but about the possibilities to imagine. It's like open a new a new box of words. Um, I started to learn learn German when I was eighteen, as I, as I as I told you. And I was absolutely fascinated about this um, uh, thing about German that to add a word and, and add another word to construct a big word. And I was fascinated about this, uh, this thing about knowing exactly the way of how an idea is built mm. just by adding words. And I think that and of course, also to think about uh, the place you are, where you are, or the name for the colors, or the name for how do you feel. In I don't know if also in English, but here in, in Mexico or in Spanish, it's common to think that, ah, okay, this spelling should, there should be a, a word for this spelling in German. Yeah, like this complex yeah, uh, constructions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, this for sure. That's all. Uh, and also there's something uh, fascinating for me in this uh, language thing. Uh, for many years, I've been teaching German. That's my my a job I have, and I really love the faces of my students when they get a new word or they understand another way to say something. Yeah, or they get what specifically a word means or why are they using uh, the language in another way. And of course, I love also, and I am really interested interested in in these uh, literary uh, exercises like Ostomar or your or the writing also in it as, as we talk today in the morning uh, this political position and this experiment uh, this experiment about political and aesthetic yeah how can we build uh, not just uh, a new sense of a word but a new a new constructions with this uh, mixing languages yeah um yeah i think that's very i was gonna tell you too about the um well what you're saying about german is very fascinating what yeah one thing that i wondered is um do you feel we have a similar freedom in spanish to to do that kind of language making or do you think that's um something that's that's unique to to german what do you mean? I, I, I like, think, uh, um, just like the with German, you can create a new word out of a very complicated um, yeah. set of realities and emotions and feelings. Um, do you think that we have less freedom in Spanish to do that kind of create like new new language in that way? No, I don't think that we have less freedom in Spanish. I think that uh, all languages are like. Uh, endless, uh, have many possibilities or, or, but I think for me, it's important to know that they, 
that another way to do that exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it can be, you, you can think about that in another way, not, not with a sentence, but a word. Yeah. Um, and we, yeah, we were talking earlier because we, we met earlier today, just to say hello, yeah. um, about languages as a political place to, um, I think in, so I know that for Colombian immigrants and I, it must be the same in other South American countries too, or just worldwide, this must be the same. Um, but for Colombia specifically, because we've had so many different waves of violence. And so there's people that have left in the 60s. There's people that left in the 70s. There's people that left in the 80s and people that left in the 90s. Um, and when we, you know, like I was someone that left in the 90s. And then when I go back to Colombia, it's very obvious to Colombians, they can figure out what decade I left because my lingo or like the words that I use are from the 90s. So it's almost like hearing, you know, like if you, if, you know, it would be like the same experience if we just like put on an American TV show from the 70s and they speak in a very specific way. It would be like that where we like Colombians come back and then people hear you and they're like, you have not been here for, like, we don't say this anymore. <laughs> it's just, it's just and, then it's like, and then the, and then the language kind of, it can become like a fossil or it can become kind of proof of your migration um, in that way. Uh, but it, but it just, it, um, it just reminded me of that just because of the way that you're um, throughout the book, just talking of, of language as a, as a place that we either leave or try to return to. Um, so there's also a lot of um, essays that, that touch on um, post-war post and there's one about the, the Berlin Wall. Um, I, was, I was very fascinated, to, and this is another angle at like a, looking at a place. Um, and what, what leaving or, or coming to a place means and memory. Um, but you were saying that um, to, to go to Berlin and to kind of walk around, you need three maps. And there's, yeah. right, there's like one that's the train. There's another one that's like the, the, the street map with all the names. And then there's one that's like with the, where the Berlin wall used to be. Um, so that's, there's, there's almost like a, a third map that's that's historical and that's you you know it's now like imaginary but it's tracing like a very real place um for people who live there where they might that might live in their in their memory um and it seems like maybe like one of the most honest relationships to place that i've ever heard about i think that when we when we live in a city we live in a place maybe we think of one map we think of the one map that's current and we don't think about the, the, the other one that might be like the history of what's gone. Um, and um, so I wondered if you could talk about the connections you see between imagination, people's imagination, memory, migration and war. Yes, of course. Uh, I think this is related with what you said uh, now about uh, talking like an extinct Colombian language, right? Mm -hmm. I think that that's, it's like um, migration, I think, could open uh, an imaginary place where time uh, or where places are the same for many years. So maybe this kind of wish to come back to a place is impossible because this place doesn't exist anymore even in, in language. I've never heard about this, you just said about, uh, they know when you left Colombia because of the words you use. I think yeah. it's a great, a great uh, to write about, yeah? Yeah, no, I should, I should write about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanna read that, <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, and I, I thought about a lot about this uh, migration, as I told you, because I, uh, at that time when I started to write this book, uh, I, this experience about being foreigner was close to me. 
and I also was working in my masters uh, with uh, in with a novel called Cassandra, hmm. uh, written by a German writer Christa Wolf, and all that uh, stories or the city or Germany in the post-war is a constant in their in their work. So all that questions and um, that place and what and, and the question about why happened what happened is really present in, in Krista Bob's work. So also that's why it's a common, it's really, it's a present in, in everything about these questions are appeared in my essays. That's the reason because that time I was thinking about them at that time. Um, as I told you also, uh, I write, I, a lot, I wrote a lot of these essays uh, from a trip. I, I went to, to La Habana with my parents, uh, I think about 10 years ago or more, maybe. And I remember that when I, when I was writing that essay about uh, Peter Pan operation, uh, I worked with a map. I am really used to, to write with maps because uh, this abstract representation helps me a lot to think and to, to see where I want to focus my, my questions, where I want to, to, to be in that place. So it's like kind of my process, my writing process, yeah? Like to, and I think that many of my essays works like this, like being uh, far and then close to a place. Uh, and that comes from, from the maps. I work a lot with maps and with photographs. I like to, to, to um, work with a photo and ask me what's outside, what ca I can see, and I start to think in, in narrative lines uh, from that photo. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your question, maybe I- oh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I just, I also love maps. Um, and so I'm just, I was just thinking about how, um, yeah, what a, what a beautiful process that is to just go somewhere and then begin your, Kind of thinking inquiry into that place just by looking at a map. Um, and so I just I also wanted to give everyone like more of a sense of what's what's covered. Um, it's the book is kind of like a it's kind of like a prism um, in that we're just like looking at different angles of what um, what moving means or like what taking a trip means. So the first one is the is Bill Lishman, and it's this look into a man who kind of took to the skies, you know, embraced the unfamiliar, you know, developed this relationship with birds. Um, there's another one about Cappadocia, which is a, it's like a, a city underground, right? Yeah. Um, Cassandra, which you just mentioned. Um, the 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 Cuban the Peter Pan operation which uh, was it was when a lot of parents in Cuba um, heard that Fidel Castro and the Socialist Party was going to take uh, children and put them into um, camps and so then they sent their children en masse to the United States and then a lot of un unaccompanied minors um, were then just living here and it just kind of it was seen something as temporary and then it just became something that lasted for a while. And so then that's the story of people who are um, kind of just like very surprisingly uprooted. And then I just really um, connected with this idea that you, you're surprisingly uprooted. And then the desire to return back um, is always there. And as you were saying, that's not possible. There's very few times where that is possible where you can return to a place because as time goes by, you're different, the place is different, you return and it, it's just no longer the place that you thought, even if you are back onto the land. Um, so then there's the one about Ozdamar, there's Merlin. You also talk about VHS and just traveling yeah. to a place by memory, which, so I just wanted to say like the, it's, it's such a beautiful array of just like looking at um, what what place means or like what taking a trip means. Um, and it's this beautiful meditation about how it all kind of intersects with, um, with memory. 
so I just I was saying that just to um to for for our viewers to, just to give you like a larger sense of why we're talking about like a lot of different things um <laughs> Mariana I was also wondering um what I know that you're you're very interested in in translation um, yeah. And you're very interested in language and, and what it can do. I was very curious about your your experience when you got um, your your book translated and what it was like to to see the text in in English. Well, it, it was fascinating. I think that uh, well, uh, Julia Sanchez, the, the the translator who did this job, is amazing. We we worked uh, together and. She um, did a lot of questions to me, like about, I think that, that she did so close reading of my book and she did questions I never uh, thought even I wrote that book. Mm. Yeah, so and reading these paragraphs in, in English was like, uh, I, I had this sensation that it is me, but it's not me, it's like, uh, strange you know because I am really used to write and hear what I'm writing mm -hmm. I, I I know I, I need to find um, a specific rhythm and I just can't do this in Spanish and reading my book in English was like a, another book close to me yeah, yeah. It's like half mine and half uh, Julia Julia's yeah so yeah. Mm, I really love that process and, and working with transit books also uh, has been a really great experience. And, and having my book the day, I remember perfectly the day the books came, I was like, whoa, what a beautiful book. And it's like, uh, it's mine, I can't believe it, you know? Oh, and, yes. and of course, because I, I, I wrote um, Migratory Birds between 2013 and 15, so it's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, do you, will it come out in German? Are there is there talk for? Because I was thinking that's like your your the language that you're like closest to. Um, what is are there plans for a German translation? I, I I don't think so. I don't know. Adam should know. We'll that, just put so it. We'll put it out there as something that could happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that would be. I've thought about that because I I think that maybe this book in German would be. It, it's like somebody in Spanish talking about German languages could be strange, I think, but also interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know what you mean about the book seeming strange when it's if it's a tongue that you speak and you read it in another language, it just feels it feels the same. It almost feels like it's your book, but it's Halloween and it has a costume on. Like it, it feels there's a strange. <laughs> And how do you feel about that? About that, because in your case, it's, it's I think in particular because it's written in English and then a translation in your into your your mother tongue. So how do you feel it? It's, um, I'm really yeah, really curious about that. Yeah, I was saying I, I I think I you know on the one hand when I was writing my novel I was um, doing this I was trying to occupy this um, experimental place with language where. In my regular life, I was I was working as an interpreter, um, and so I was doing a lot of hearing one language and then speaking another instantly. So I would hear Spanish and then I would speak in English instantly, and I got very used to what that felt like internally in my in my brain. And that's when I was working on the on the novel. So I started to do that same kind of process as I was writing. I would imagine it in Spanish and then kind of auto translate as I'm going into English. Um, and so it just resulted in this very, you know, strange translation or what I would say is like the wrong way to translate something. Um, and I was very interested in leaving a trace that this was, you know, it's a story that happens in Colombia. The people who are the, all the characters are if not speaking Spanish, then Spanish is their second language. And I wanted to kind of like leave a trace of that into, in the text. Um, so when, so then when it was translated into Spanish, um, it, on the one hand, it felt like the original version that I had thought in my head when I first conceived the text, but which I never wrote because it just only existed in my brain. Um, and, 
the the experiment with language was suddenly just not present because then it's just in Spanish. And so it's like the original way that it's supposed to be um, understood. Um, so yeah, so I, it's, it's, I mean, this idea, I, of course, we all know like things are lost in translation. <laughs> For me, that was the one, that was the thing that was lost in translation when it was um, translated into the into my mother tongue. Um, but there's, I mean, the feeling of having my book in my mother tongue and then seeing it in Colombia. Of course, like there's, it, I was just, yeah, I was so happy and loved uh, my publisher and my translator that I worked with. Um, yeah, and it just it was it was kind of a beautiful kind of full circle thing for me for to travel back and um, and talk about it there. Um, so it's like a, a translation with Albury now, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, Mariana, what are what are you working on next? Do you have plans for what you're what you want to write next? Well, I'm working currently on my PhD dissertation, so I'm I. Almost my all the week I work in, in my dissertation. I have to read and uh, actually I'm working in, in a project about this writing, this kind of writings of uh, mixing languages. For example, I work with a with a a novel uh, from a Mexican writer called uh, Miriam Moscona, and she writes in in Judeo Spanish and Spanish at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting because you know, Yiddish, Spanish, Yiddish Spanish is a language that is not going to exist, exist anymore. Nobody speaks that, only old people. And it's this language about um, Excelium also. Uh, so I have to finish this the next year, but also I'm writing some essays for magazines. And I'm thinking in my, in my second book about, uh, I have no uh, really clear what's going to be about, of course, going to be about a long essay about diving. Mm. Uh, and yeah. Um, when like I was uh, a child, free, I, I sorry. Is it free diving, like where you hold your breath and you dive, or where you have equipment? Well, I used to swim a lot when I was a child, mm -hmm. and I was terrified about that moment of being in the high and then diving, and I hated that time. But I did a lot of times. I never, I never. Uh, feel better about that and I think that it's like something that can be repeated in many other moments of, of life of many people like repetition and and whether that nothing's happen and then again and again and again I have many questions about that about swimming and typing and breathing oh, I'm and thinking under the water I'm so yeah. interested I'm so interested I'm sold <laughs> somebody I <I'm> <laughs> thank you Ingrid um, yeah. Oh, I had one more question that I wanted to ask. Um, and just to give a heads up to everyone, if you wanted to ask, I'm going to turn to um, your questions in a second. So if you wanted to ask a question, there's the Q&A um, that you can type your question into, um, and then we'll, we'll get those answered. Um, so now's the time to, to put those in. Um, Mariana, I was wondering, were there were there stories that you left out um, of the that you you know could have been in the book, um, like other kind of fragmentary essays or other ideas that could have been in the book that that didn't make the cut? Okay, um, as I, as I told you at the beginning, I read a lot of essays when I wanted to to learn to write. Mm -hmm. uh, I read a lot uh, of essays from Natalia Ginsburg. That she's also, she also appears in, in the book, and um, I, I read I read I read she really close I read her work really really close, and I didn't say this before, but when with this um, fellowship I got, I used to work in a group with other uh, women and, and men writing also essay. So I had the fortune that uh, every month. Uh, five really good writers read my work and tell me things about uh, what, what could I read or what could I change or this sentence is not working really well. And also you can read this. And I think that that process was really absolutely important for my work because I also understood that writing never happens alone. You have to, to, 
for me, I have to write with other people. I need that somebody read what I'm I'm writing to change something or to or to not be something I can I can see because I'm too close to that. And uh, you said something about fragmentary that this is structure this fragmentary structure. It's like a, uh, I thought that I couldn't write something really really long, so I just started to write in just short paragraphs. And then I, I think that. Uh, these were like uh, this um, a construction, right? To 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 build something bigger than just a smaller one. Um, and I did um, the. Um, do you think I I did want to ask you about your process? Do you think that you will keep that process where you have a a group of trusted readers read your your work as you even ask i guess post graduation are you going to try to keep that structure to to for your process mm. well i i don't know if if my if the process is going to be the same but i can't i i'm really close to my academic research now and of course, all these questions that that come from my readings, I think that maybe in, in some time are going to to be a book, and, and again, I'm going to be this like this jump from academic to creative writing. Again, that's the way migratory birds came. Also, yeah. For example, uh, summer, uh, this essay about Otsama was a, a paper I wrote at the beginning. And and then I started to 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 find another perspective, to mm. think about her writing, and to to make another questions to her writing. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean the the thing that I love about your writing and the way that it that it also when when I when you know reading the book is that there it feels like a thinking process. It feels like I am with you, thinking very deeply. Um, and just in a, just such a beautiful range about what these things mean. Um, so I really love the way that it that it came together. And I also love to hear that it was just your natural, it kind of came that way to you. Um, well, I, I, at that moment, when I started, I, I had just my academic tool research. research. So I was used to, to look for photos or to make this archival research, yeah, like paper, newspaper, or photos, and also I always uh, work between words, yeah, like uh, looking for words for words roots, or how do I say this in another language, and what can I see in this word that is almost the same but not the same, yeah. Word is also I think that uh, words roots are really helpful to think in this journey that words have done also mm -hmm. yeah That's when nice. these words appear and why mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. was happening uh, that we need a new word to name to to give a name of something yeah okay. so fascinating um we do have a question here's one question um kathleen mccray is asking i'm interested in your choosing Cappadocia, the underground city in your book did you do research on Turkey? Did this research affect your writing? And then they're saying, I'm looking forward to reading your book. Thank you. Well, I, it's, it's a little bit, it's funny what, what, how I came to Cappadoc Cappadocia. Uh, I went to the Turkai because a friend of mine got married with a, a, a Turkey. So we went, a, a big group of friends went to, to, to the wedding party there. But we also did a, a little uh, some travel into Turkey. Uh, so I, but I think that my relation with with Turkey is uh, through uh, Emin Sebdiot's summer writing, because when I find her books, I notice that she had many questions I had. For example, she talks a lot about her body. Uh, into a place that in in many, many ways tells her that she doesn't belong there. 
for example, uh, there's a paragraph where she's meeting a croissant and her feet are hanging, hanging, yeah, because she's too short for that place. And it's like, yes. like a yes. detail, but it's absolutely political, yeah? Like how everything is designed and how these become, it's really clear when you are a foreigner. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how I, I, I came to Turkai. To and I think that Cappadocia was absolutely fascinating because it's a place like in another world. Yeah, like everything full of sand and these caves and extremely hot. And, and at the same time, a place for tourists. For tourist. So it's an uh, animal that doesn't belong there just to to fix into this stereotype about uh, the Orient, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did. I, one of the things that I really loved about reading your book and just as I'm saying, like going on this thinking journey with you was how much I would just put the book down and then fall into this rabbit hole of like looking up what these places were and just like seeing videos and like seeing images of it. Um, so it really felt, I mean, I've, it's, it's, it felt like a very, very much like a conversation. And I think the fragmentary way that you've written it also invites that from the reader, because there's all of these natural places to kind of pause and, and kind of say like, is that like with the Bill Lishman <laughs> story, when I first read it, I was like, this is, I need to see this. <laughs> I need to see like video. <laughs> Like what is this is such a strange thing yeah it sounds um, like fiction right yeah and that's I, I love yeah so I, I love that um so it's very it's so surprising and it's just like such a beautiful um journey that we went with you um we have a request to if you wanted to read a little bit in Spanish so I don't know if you wanted to maybe like read um maybe like a one paragraph or a few lines in Spanish? Yes, of course. Uh, which uh, which essay? Whatever I want. I think they're just, they're saying, Mariana, pudiera le pudieras leer un poco, un poco en español. So there's just a, a language request. <laughs> okay. Eh, ¿Hay algún ensayo en especial? O yo leo el que, un fragmento del que, del que yo, yo creo, quiera. Un fragmento que te parezca. Vale. Okay. Oh, we're talking about uh, Emine Otzdamar, so maybe I can read a, a part of that essay. In Spanish, it's called uh, La Lengua de Otzdamar. <clears throat> Voy a leer el epígrafe, que es también de, de Otzdamar. I want to read this. Yeah. Eh, La Lengua de Otzdamar. En mi idioma se llama lengua, idioma. La lengua no tiene huesos. Hacia donde se retuerce uno, se retuerce ella. Estaba sentada con mi lengua retorcida en esta ciudad de Berlín. Eminencia Biotstomar. Uno. Llegó a trabajar durante seis meses en una de las fábricas de Berlín Oeste a los 18 años. Los ojos habituados a los colores de Estambul, el cabello espeso y oscuro. No acostumbraba a usar velo, pero en Alemania las obreras debían cubrirse la cabeza con una red. Ya se consideraba coleccionista de palabras, pero aún no conocía alguna en alemán. El turco era su lengua y la lengua de su madre. Llegó a una ciudad vendida por la mitad que existía alrededor de un muro de hormigón y sus torres de vigilancia, los puntos de control y el empeño de algunos en frenar la huida de otros. Su casa, Estambul, también era dos ciudades, pero la frontera entre ambas no era de piedra, sino un margen líquido que ha estado desde ahí siempre, el Bósforo, un estrecho donde el principio o el final de Asia y Europa se alcanzan con la mirada desde cualquier borde. En sus aguas, la corriente del Mar Negro alimenta al Mármara y ambos se convierten en un mismo flujo. Al sur del Bósforo, del lado europeo, el mar abrió un camino sobre la tierra y dividió a Estambul en otras dos orillas de siete kilómetros que albergan mezquitas, palacios y la Torre de Gálata. En esa zona, llamada Cuerno de Oro, el agua es dulce y salada al mismo tiempo. Escribió sobre la frontera de la ciudad donde creció, la que mejor conocía. Madame Atena me contó que en otro tiempo había en Estambul dos locos. Uno se ponía en la orilla europea y decía, desde aquí Estambul es mío. Y el otro se ponía en la orilla del lado asiático y gritaba hacia el lado europeo, desde aquí Estambul es mío. 
Quizá Otsdamar se fue a Berlín buscando otra ciudad que también, tuvie, que también estuviese atravesada por una frontera. Muchas gracias. Um, and that was a beautiful, it was such a beautiful um, part of the book. Um, and it's talking about, as we're saying, like Ozdemar's, um, her idea of place and just feeling out of place um, and just how language can also be like a border that you carry, your body is kind of a border that you carry. Um, so I invite everyone to read the book. We're, we're at the end of our time. It's called Migratory Birds. It's beautiful. Um, it's a very enjoyable, very um, quick read. And this is part of the Transit Books Undelivered Lectures, which is such an amazing um, uh, thing that they're doing, if you want to check it out. Um, so I want to invite Jack, if Jack, if you're around. Um, and thank you, Mariana, so much for, for joining us from Mexico City. I loved our conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ingrid. And thank you so much, Jack, for having me here today. I really enjoyed this conversation oh. with Ingrid. Thank you so much to the both of you. I wish we could uh, continue and uh, and talk for two more hours, but unfortunately, we 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 don't have the time to spare. But uh, we encourage everyone to uh, to check out um, uh, um, the books um, by these authors. Uh, it's um, why they write them. So let's go and support them. And uh, thank you again uh, for taking the time to beam in from Mexico City. Uh, it was it was great, Mariana. And um, the Liquid Festival continues through October 23rd. The details are at liquid.org. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Ciao.